Okay, welcome to the second episode of Complete Sports Care's Q and A. Um, today, I've got with me Mark Skoll, so titled APA Sports Physio, uh, PhD candidate, and second member of the CSC Beard Club. Uh, thanks for joining us. Good on you, Dave. Thanks for having me. Um, firstly, I. I did a bit of a, a Google search of Mark Skulls just before, and I don't know if you're aware of this. Is um, it actually the first thing that pops up is Mark Skulls, Australian cricketer. Um, it's, this is actually a Wikipedia page, and um, it's actually got your picture in it. Correct, not edited by me. I had a patient point that out to me, and I was like, and they said, "You're apparently you're a really good cricketer." And I'm also 49, which yeah, yeah. or even older. But um, yeah, despite the beard, I'm not not quite that old yet. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I thought that was that was quite funny. I'll, I'll pop up a little picture, uh, maybe in the video, uh, so people can have a look. But. Um, I thought it might have been a bit of a prank by one of your PhD chums or something like no. that. <laughs> Although John Scholes was a Victorian cricket coach. No relation, unfortunately. Although I used to no. claim that when I was younger. I was like, oh, he's a distant relation. So firstly, um, tell us a bit about your PhD and uh, you know what you've been doing with yourself over the last few years. So uh, what have you been researching? So my PhD um, is looking really at, at early onset hip arthritis in um, in young football and soccer players. Um, so probably how how that all came about was uh, for probably eight nine years I was the head physio at um, the Dandenong Stingrays, which is a, a football club that that uh, looks at young elite football players before they move into the, the AFL. Um, and we had a lot of a lot of guys with with hip and groin pain, and, and we sort of we didn't really know uh, what was going on. And I guess at that stage we didn't really have much of an understanding around uh, how the hip joint could could influence hip and groin pain in, in these young guys. Um, and then from there, uh, that sort of spawned my interest in, in hip and groin pain. And I was lucky enough to to meet with um, some of the researchers out at La Trobe Uni, so uh, Joe Kemp and, and Kay Crossley, and, um, and was lucky enough to get involved in a, in a big project called the FORCE project, which looks at, um, looks at following uh, this group of 200 football players that we have with hip and groin pain um, over a sort of two to hopefully, you know, five to 10 year period, um, and, and looking at their progress and how their hip and groin pain changes over that time and and whether some of those guys uh, and girls will go on to develop um, early onset hip arthritis. All right uh, so yeah really I wanted to get you on today to have a bit of a chat about uh, some of your research in particular to do with hip and groin pain and um, and you know have a, a bit of a chat about how you would go about assessing and and seeing uh, someone in the clinic that would come in with, uh, with hip or groin pain. So firstly, um, is hip and groin pain common? And what types of people typically present to the clinic with hip and groin pain? What sort of things do you tend to see? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it is. Um, it is very common. And so it's particularly common in, um, so we talk about younger people, uh, so people who play field sports, so running, basically any any sport where you run and change direction. Um, and it seems to be more prevalent in um, in kicking sports, so soccer, yeah. AFL. Um, so we see plenty of those, but also like basketball, any sort of agility-based sport, you'll, it is quite common. So if we talk about like soccer literature, um, you know, one, basically one in two Two players will have some incident of, of hip and groin pain throughout a season. So basically, yeah, 50% of a team will um, will have some sort of hip and groin pain throughout that season at some point. Mm. Um, the issue well, when that can become more serious is that is when that pain starts, starts to linger on for a longer period, um, mm. and also it can lead to players missing game time. So about so I think one in two will have pain throughout the season, and one in five will actually miss game time as a result of that but I think as well like it's not just um, hip and groin pain in the athlete mm. I see lots of patients in the clinic that are um, old older um, yeah. so not necessarily mm. young 20 you know involved in sport but um, people who may have played sport previously or not even who are mm. um, you know 30 to 50 to 60 year old mm. um, people with uh, hip and groin pain um, and that can be a, a mix of 
tendon pain around their hip and not necessarily just their hip joint yep. and also it can be uh, patients that are starting to develop hip joint pain uh, maybe potentially heading down that path towards an osteoarthritic hip joint yep. and that's probably where some of our research is looking at is what can we do with some of these people who don't have a fully arthritic hip joint but are maybe potentially heading down that pathway towards um, towards osteoarthritis of their hip As, as you've discussed, you know, hip, hip and groin pain can be potentially a lot of different things. Um, what are some of the more common things you tend to see in terms of a diagnosis? And is it, you know, is it uh, particularly important to, you know, to come to a specific diagnosis with some of these people? Yeah, yeah. And it's, I think, I guess with any sort of musculoskeletal pain, the idea of where this pain is coming on, coming from can be really tricky. And we, we know that across multiple different conditions. And I think sometimes as patients, like we like to have a label for, for what we have. Mm. Um, and, you know, sometimes that can lead us to going down the path of doing imaging to try and pick one particular structure that, that is the cause of our pain. What we know from, from, from the hip and groin pain research is that um, there, there's a really poor, I guess, correlation between um, what we see on our scans in terms of identifying particular structures within the hip joint um, and, you know, and, and the association with pain. Um, so we see in, in, in hip pain and in, in young people with who basically who play sport, we see really similar findings in people who do have pain and people who don't have pain. So um, I think that's really important when patients are thinking about imaging as a, as a source of, or I guess as trying to get to the bottom of what is causing their pain. Mm -hmm. Often imaging doesn't actually give us all that much information. Mm -hmm. So what we tend to do around the hip is we can classify things uh, clinically. So there's a number of different like groin pain um, conditions that we will commonly refer to. Um, so if we think about like our younger patient who plays football, um, they might have some adductor related pain, which is basically the, the inner thigh muscles and where those muscles attach up onto the bone. Um, and there's also other categories. So hip flexor related pain, pubic related pain um, and, and inguinal pain, which is sort of that groin region. And there's so many different structures within there that can be the source of those symptoms. But sometimes identifying that individual structure doesn't change the management that you're going to do mm. with that patient. And yeah. so that's where the using those clinical sort of classifications can be beneficial. So it points you in the right direction. It says, this is the area where the problem is, um, but we don't necessarily need to know the exact structure. Hypothetical scenario. So you've got a, a, ki a kicking athlete that's uh, coming into the clinic with, uh, you know, hip related groin pain. So apart from, you know, going through some of your diagnostic testing and, and, and things like that, what, what are you tending to assess? So what are you looking at with that particular person? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so like we were saying, Dave, with that, like we once we're sort of in the area of where we think, you know, we, where we think the pain might be coming from, um, as a clinician, I like to take a, a like an impairments based approach, which basically means um, what we are looking for, are, are whether that's a movement pattern, whether it's a strength, whether it's a, a range of movement or flexibility. Um, are there any deficits in any of those areas which might be contributing to why a patient's pain might have started? Or why a patient's pain might be ongoing? So we know that when someone has pain, they they are uh, likely to then, you know, might develop some some weakness associated with that pain. So the longer that someone's pain goes on for, maybe they develop more and more weakness through that particular area. So that might be yeah. secondary to the pain, but it also might be a reason why their pain had started. Yeah. And so we can look at impairments being like, like a, I would say like a strength or range of movement impairment, but we can also look at like a, a movement pattern impairment as well. And so sometimes patients will be, they might be incredibly strong, but they might move in a way that places lots of load or stress on a particular structure or, or, or around 
their hip joint. So, mm. you know, for different patients, you might do do different things. So we, uh, so for me, like I, like we said, we get to the point we think we ha we have an idea where we know where the pain is coming from. I would then do a really thorough uh, sort of strength assessment around their hip. So looking at um, you know, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, so in and out of the hip. Um, and also your hip is a ball and socket, so it also does rotation. So we have a look at all those different planes of movement and the strength associated with those. Um, and then from there, like you, you're looking at a movement um, assessment so often so it depends on the patient really so whatever their goals are whatever their chosen sport activity mm. whatever it is we look at that and we look at the way that they move and see if there is a reason why that is painful and is there something that we can do to to change that or, or reduce their pain in some way so you talked about you know strength as part of your assessment there um is it all about the glutes or, or do you look at it? Uh, I feel sorry for patients because most <laughs> patients come to me and they say, I've been told I've got weak glutes. Um, and every patient apparently has weak, weak glutes. <laughs> so usually yeah. at that point, then I explain to patients, well, there's like multiple components to your glutes. So you're, you know, you've got your glute med and your glute min, which do hip abduction. And then you've got your glute max, which does hip extension and some rotation. And it's like, well, which one of those is weak? And so most of them don't, most patients don't really understand that there's, you know, multiple different components. Usually it's, it's because someone has probably pushed on their glutes and found that they're tight. And tightness doesn't necessarily mean weakness. Um, and, and so that there's, when I think about deficits and impairments, like we we're talking about then, mm. we're thinking about probably movements more than muscles. So is a particular mm -hmm. movement, say hip abduction weak, um, and there's many muscles which contribute to hip abduction and not just your glutes. Mm -hmm. And so we're thinking about that movement and then how does that movement weakness um, contribute to the way that someone moves? And so that's where combining your movement assessment with your strength assessment to sort of create this picture of you know what are we going to do with this patient yeah, so yeah right. so definitely it's it's not the glutes and and often <laughs> it's a lot of those other muscles that need to be addressed because patients have spent you know two or three years working on their glutes day in day <laughs> out and being really diligent and they're like their, their pain is no better yeah. and so if that's the answer then their pain would probably be better by now. So mm. it's looking at some of those other things that might be contributing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it's a big one that we tend to see coming into the clinic. Everyone uh, has always been told that uh, their glutes are weak, um, even if they've got a shoulder problem, I reckon. Um, <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, it's a really common one. Yeah. 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 yeah, we're asking, we're asking the big questions here on, uh, on CSC Q and A. Um, so, and potentially insulting questions here, given that you've uh, spent the last three years researching some of this sort of stuff. But running biomechanics, do they matter? Yeah, yep. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> would be the answer to that, Dave. So, um, so my my research is looking uh, looking at running biomechanics in our in our cohort. So we have our guys with guys and girls with hip and groin pain, and then we have a, a group of control patients who don't have hip and groin pain, but but also play play football and soccer. So my um, one of my uh, components of the, my research is looking at do people with hip and groin pain run in a different way to, to patients or people without pain. Um, and so probably some of the, um, the reason why we're doing this study is that there's not really any information out there um, in terms of looking at hip and groin pain and, um, and, and running biomechanics. And so we, in, in short, at the moment, we can't answer that question as, as, as to whether it does matter or it doesn't matter. Mm. Um, but if we look at other conditions like patellofemoral joint pain, and, and mm. I think we know that running mechanics can make a difference in, in those populations and, and you can change someone's running mechanics to alleviate some of their symptoms. And so for our, our, uh, our hip and groin pain group, 
they've done a, a little bit of, there's been a little bit of um, research looking at lower load tasks. So walking um, and, and sort of low impact tasks like that. But the issue with our, particularly our younger patients is that they have pain and they have trouble when they're doing high impact sporting tasks. And so we actually need to look at those tasks to see if we can identify if there is a difference in, in their movement patterning. Mm. And then what that then allows us to do is then um, look at strategies to try and change that. Mm. And so, you know, obviously the research is often behind what we do mm. in the clinic. So clinically, I would say that yes, running mechanics is important for, for these people with hip and groin pain. And, and yes, we can change someone's hip and groin pain by manipulating the way that they, they do run. And I, I always like to think that we're sort of at a bit, of a bit of an advantage at the hip joint is because we've got two other joints below, which we can, we can use to try and absorb some of that load potentially to mm. maybe shift some load away from someone's hip. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So I think it's there is scope there to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, it's probably very hard, probably with the the study design um, that you were talking about there to uh, to answer this question. But uh, you know, are some of these running mechanics uh, potentially able to cause someone's hip and groin pain, or or is it more the other way? Do someone's hip and groin pain tend to uh, change someone's running mechanics. Um, what, yeah. What there? Yeah. So yeah, agreed. So tricky. So an awesome question, and that's and that's really comes uh, comes down to I guess how movement can influence both the development of mm. symptoms and also how it can be a response to to the presence of pain. So I think the issue that we have as as clinicians is we don't see generally people who are healthy. So if you don't have if you don't have hip and groin pain, then you're not in the you're not necessarily coming to us asking, you know, about your running mechanics. So, um, and that's what we were saying before. It's a bit of chicken, chicken or the egg. And maybe some of our early data that we're looking at with our guys is they they may actually run in a way that that increases load on their hip joint. So the typical thought pattern would be that if you have pain, you're going to shift load away from that structure. But potentially some of our data is almost looking as though um, patients are running in a way that's increasing load on their hip joints. So it's, it's almost counterintuitive. So, you know, for those for those guys, we might actually be trying to shift load away from their um, away from their hip joint to reduce their symptoms. Um, so we've looked a little bit at uh, running retraining. We've we've discussed uh, sort of this impairments based approach that you're talking about. So addressing the impairments that we're seeing in the clinic, like strength and range and all those sorts of things. Um, what other things um, do you tend to discuss uh, with your with your hip and gro groin pain patients uh, in terms of their overall management um, when uh, yeah when you when you're seeing them in the clinic? Is there anything else that you would tend to address? Yeah, I think. Um, I I always say to patients like it's um, you know you can do you can do really great strengthening you can do really great movement retraining but you you can't sort of out exercise constantly aggravating your pain so if there's if it's a loading issue if your loads are, are really 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 high and you're constantly irritating your hip joint or the structures around your hip joint um, it's unlikely that you're going to see a, a major uh, improvement, particularly in the short term, with your with your pain um, with your pain levels, it's really hard to build strength if you're constantly sore. Right. Um, so that would be one. So I think, a, a, to some degree, reducing loads down to a, a level that are um, uh, tolerable and manageable, and allows patients to to do their rehab and and do their rehab really well. Um, and I think as well, just had that conversation about identifying um, uh, ag potentially aggravating activities. So for hip and groin pain in particular, like even sitting can be a really aggravating activity for, mm. for patients with hip pain. And that's not 
just um, uh, like hip joint pain, but also sometimes patients. Um, uh, so middle-aged women is, is a really good category for these this type of pain where they get lateral hip pain, which is re related to the, the tendon pain around the outside of the hip. Mm. And so even when we are sitting, we can be loading both our hip joint and those, those lateral hip um, structures and tendons. So uh, looking at things that are important and that are, are a main um, uh, a main limitation for patients and looking at strategies to address those things. So sitting posture, standing yeah. posture, um, even laying down, uh, there are sometimes can be painful. So there's always strategies and things that we can do throughout the day that can help to alleviate your symptoms. And then it really, it gives you a really good bang for your, for your buck when you're doing your rehab. I think that's a really good overview, Mark. I think we've we've covered most of the questions there that I wanted to get through, which is fantastic. Uh, so um, thank you very much for coming on and joining us and good luck with the rest of your, your PhD uh, and uh, hopefully get it all done by the end of October. Beautiful, thanks Dave, thank you for having me and good luck with your finishing your research too. Thanks mate. <laughs>